a warm, sunny welcome to you all. Heartwarming to see so many of you here participating in our joyous 40th anniversary. I invite you to visit our webpage, make.org forward slash 40th, to familiarize yourself of what we have in store this year. The special fundraiser we have is sponsor a seat for our grantees, all 462 of them, at our virtual luncheon towards the end of the year. There's even a virtual round table to see how many seats we already have full. A very exciting activity we have, open to all, is the photo competition. There are great prizes to win, entry is free, and the theme is, what else? Women build a better world. I have a small request for you all now. In the chat box on your screen, could you please share with us since when you have been part of this amazing Meg family? The family member who has been with us the longest, I think, is our first grantee from 1983, Marion Suba, and she is here with us sharing her beautiful smile. We also thank Esther and Faith for joining us. They are having a midnight feast and will be able to answer questions you would like to pose to them. Just uh, technically practical things, if you could please, uh, uh, please be on silent uh, while the presentation is going on or when you, except if you want to speak up and also, Please pose questions while the presentation is going on in the chat box. We will get back to them and people will answer. Thank you. Shall we start? Thank you. 1981. It all started with an idea. Find one exceptional woman and she'll change the world. So we started small with one grantee. Today, we've backed 460 from 75 countries. Esther became a Supreme Court judge, changing women's rights laws in Uganda. Malady makes influential films about social topics in India. And Josefina's organization improves the health of Nicaragua's most vulnerable. Our sincere gratitude to our volunteers, donors, and friends. We've done a lot in 40 years, and with your help, we'll do a lot more. Hello, I am so happy to warmly welcome you to Meg Talks Environment. We have an amazing duo of MMEG grantees today. My name is Vesna, and I am a member of the MMEG board. MMEG is celebrating a big anniversary this year, 40 years in action. Since 1981, MMEG has supported women's higher education by awarding educational grants amounting to a total of $4.1 million to 455 exceptional women. We are lucky to have two of these exceptional women with us today. Our talk today is the first in a series of Meg Talks on various topics ranging from, the, from health to the arts, in which we will be showcasing the extraordinary women who have received MMEG grants and who are working in all these fields. Today, our focus is on the environment. Increasing evidence shows that if you care about women, you should care about the environment. And if you care about the environment, you should care about women. MMEG has translated this into financial support of women who are active agents in environmental action in their communities, such as our grantees today. As someone I know recently said, we have entered a decade of reckoning when it comes to climate change. That person I will now introduce, my colleague on the MMEG board, Stephanie Miller, who will be moderating this discussion. Stephanie headed the Climate Business Department at the International Finance Corporation. She is the founder of Zero Waste in DC and has recently written a book entitled Zero Waste Living. Stephanie, we're pleased to have you moderating today. 
Thank you so much, Vesna. And I'm really excited to be able to introduce uh, the, our first two grantees in a field that I am so passionate about. So let me start off by uh, introducing Esther Chigumira. She was uh, awarded a MEG grant in 2013. She holds a PhD in geography from the University of Oregon, as well as a BA and master's from Rhodes University. In addition to being a MEG grantee, she's also a Fulbright scholar. She's been a lecturer and researcher at the University of Zimbabwe in areas of land reform, agriculture, climate change, and resilience building. And she's currently a senior agricultural specialist at the World Bank. So it's great to have you here, Esther. And now let me just briefly introduce um, our second grantee in this field, Faith Kudzai Chihumbiri. She received her MEG grant in 2018. She holds a master's in environmental management from Stellenbosch University in South Africa and a bachelor's in forest resources and wildlife management from the National University of Science and Technology in Zimbabwe. Faith is a sustainability professional with over 10 years of experience working with local governments to develop strategies and action plans uh, to, uh, to build resilience to climate change, which is so important. She's currently an environmental officer at the Western Cape government in South Africa. So welcome to you both. It is so great that we're able to connect um, in these strange times. And let me kick off uh, with a question to Esther. I'd love to hear what excites you right now the most about your work. Thank you very much, Stephanie and Fesna. It's really great to be here. Um, so for me, what really excites me about my work has really come through this transition that I did from academia into practice. Um, and just the impact of the work that I'm currently doing here in Zimbabwe in terms of our policy dialogue with the government of Zimbabwe. Um, I've just been excited to see some of the discussions that we've been having translate into actual policy documents. Um, a key area was we were working on the visioning of the agri-food sector, um, the transformation of that, we held various scenario planning discussions with government. And last year, government came up with their own um, agricultural transformation strategy. But critical to that is that from the strategy, you start getting different blueprints, like the livestock agricultural growth plan, horticulture growth plan, which is really critical to the transformation of Zimbabwe's agriculture. So I, I, I've just been so excited seeing policy really translated and shaping what will be the future of Zimbabwe's agriculture sector. And I see transformation happening and it's starting now. So that excites me. Thank you, over to you. Thank you, Esther. That is exciting for me to hear as well. That's wonderful. Uh, let me turn to Faith and let me ask you, where do you feel you're making the most difference in your work? Thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you, Vesna. And yeah, thank you for having me. So for me, I feel that uh, I'm making a difference or an impact through bringing to the fore the youthful uh, voice to contribute to policy making and making of strategies and action plans within the Western Cape government. Uh, as you mentioned, I am in the Climate Change Directorate within the Western Cape, and uh, our duty entails mainstreaming climate change into the different sector plans that are at a provincial level. And these sector plans include health, agriculture, human settlements, amongst others. So uh, as you know, there are two uh, main measures uh, in responding to climate change, and these are either mitigation which is reducing the carbon emissions or adaptation, which is how people will cope and adjust their livelihoods and their operations to the prevailing uh, climate. And so my job entails uh, reviewing the sector plans to ensure that climate change has been considered, as well as at the local government level, to check that municipalities 
have also considered the adaptation aspect for climate change. And, um, and going further, I also support the different sectors in developing their local action plans. And one that's quite close to my heart is, uh, some of you might be aware, the Western Cape is coming from a multi-year drought, which started in 2015 and uh, lasted up until 2019. So I was part of a team that put together uh, what is called an ecological infrastructure investment framework. So this is set to guide and coordinate uh, management of the landscape as well as investments into the province's landscape. And um, again, so that we uh, improve the province's uh, water security profile in the end of the more droughts that are anticipated into the future. So what's very exciting about this is these meetings is often it's uh, people who are in their 50s, 60s and 70s, and it's also quite male dominated. And um, I find myself that there is that impact when I bring in the youthful voice at, at times the feminine voice as well, so that that filters through to decision making of the strategies and action plans uh, within the province. Thank you. Uh, that is also great to hear. And I think the mainstreaming aspect of, of climate uh, is so important. Um, and I, I think you've actually given me a great segue into the next question I wanted to ask you as you were starting to talk about gender. And um, I think, uh, you know, coming from where we are, uh, Meg, uh, wanting to support exceptional women doing exceptional things for their communities and women and children included. Um, it would be great to talk with you a little bit now about the intersection that you see in your work between gender and climate. Uh, it's, it's uh, I think, an important issue that both of you, if I understand correctly, through your work, have touched on uh, quite directly. So um, maybe let me start with uh, with Faith and ask you how you feel, you're, you've started talking about it, but how you feel your work is impacting women. Sure. So I think uh, the climate change I experienced differently between men and women. And often it's the women who bear the this disproportionate burden of the negative impacts of climate change. I'll give an example in a family setup in a, a traditional like setting, for example, here in the, in the Western Cape. We know that men, or we are conditioned to believe that men go out to get a job in wages or a salary. Women are viewed primarily as caregivers and the roles that are associated with women include cooking, cleaning, subsistence agriculture, and uh, fetching water for the household. And usually women don't get remuneration for their efforts, despite the time and energy they use in the process. And uh, one study that I was reading, there was an article that I was reading about Sub-Saharan Africa, and it says on average, women spend uh, an average of 30 minutes a day uh, collecting water. So given the longer and more frequent droughts that are projected, as a result of uh, climate change, this will result in women spending more time in search of water. And this also uh, poses a high risk as they are exposed to sexual predators and other form of uh, abuse whilst they are out there searching for water. And then uh, also we talked about subsistence agriculture. The occurrence of floods will also mean that, of floods and drought will also mean that um, their food production is also compromised, and that also compromises the food security for the family. So these factors actually magnify the existing inequalities and also reduce the women's ability to cope with the effects of uh, climate change. And also turning slightly to the mainstream economic activities, gender equality has been elusive for quite a while. And uh, as an inherited legacy, one finds that men predominantly hold high level positions in the workplace where decision making takes place with minimum or, more, or no participation at all of women and their unique needs. This despite that women are forming a larger contingent of the, of the workforce in the areas. And so uh, the Western Cape government has developed what is uh, referred to as the gender equity strategic framework. 
And uh, this framework will guide how gender issues will be interrogated and applied to policies and strategies so that the sector policies are not gender neutral, neither will they be gender blind. It's coming out that while policy is uh, quite important, well, they say it's vital, there is need uh, to also match that with action. And the action that's coming out uh, from the discussion is the importance of educating and empowering women, starting with the girl child. And again, at this point, it's also the time that I would also like to recognize the efforts by MMEG, where they're empowering and uh, supporting the girl child. And uh, there were recommendations that, you know, it's, it, it is better to actually expose uh, the girl children and women to opportunities that climate change is presenting. So it is uh, exposing them to the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics subjects, the STEM, so that they gain capabilities to lead in this whole revolution towards a green economy. There are sectors that are emerging, such as renewable energy, energy efficiency in buildings, waste management, and waste minimization the whole secular economy uh, sector. So once we get our women or girls uh, empowered to actually lead decision-making in this level, it actually also contributes towards building their resilience to climate change. And, and uh, to end off, I would also like, and I think all this is also quite summed up in the saying that says, when you have empowered a woman, you've empowered a family, and you've also empowered uh, the community. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Very, very well said, Faith. And uh, I think those are words we we live by as well. And thank you for for bringing to life uh, what it means when we talk about the the intersection between gender and climate. I think it can sound theoretical, but you've actually given us really great examples of what that means on the ground. Um, and, and both of you are such great role models for other women that want to study in this field. But let me turn to you, Esther, now. And uh, same question, and I think you've had an opportunity to uh, work not only on the gender side of uh, climate, but also uh, supporting youth. So um, tell us a little bit about your views on this subject. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, I just wanted to pick up from what Faith has said, and she was talking about subsistence agriculture and women, and women not easily able to cope with shocks, climate-related shocks. Um, and we're seeing that um, within various areas um, in Zimbabwe, and especially um, with the cyclone Idai that hits the country about a year, two years ago. And so my kind of input into this is going to come from the agriculture side where I'm seeing the impact of climate change and where we are really working on policy dialogue, not only with government, but with our counterpart um, development partners. Um, as you will be aware, or people are aware, agriculture is really kind of the anchor of most African economies and in particular for Zimbabwe. But what is really critical, and people often miss it, is when we start saying, well, who's in the agricultural labor force? What percentage of men, women are in the agricultural labor force? We tend to find that 70%, especially in Zimbabwe, of women are, find, are found in the agricultural labor force. Um, and being found in there mostly they are in the low end jobs or they are doing unpaid care work as Faith had said. And so when you start thinking about women and you start thinking about how can we empower women in agriculture, uh, some of the work that I have done, as I said, in my um, career as an academic um, and now as a development practitioner has been looking at the lens of women and young people in agricultural commercialization. I'll talk on the young people a little later, but I just want to focus now on the women. And what we have seen is that, yes, women, as I said, are in that 70% mostly unpaid labor, 
um, in the low kind of menial jobs. But if we start looking at commercialization, we know that if we empower women, they can move forward. So if we're going to be talking about women empowerment, women agriculture commercialization, we're starting to think about it from a climate smart agriculture perspective. And we're starting to think about, well, what are the things that we can invest in? Where can we put financial investment and what else can we do in terms of capacitating women and also capacitating young people? So we developed a Climate Smart Agriculture Investment Plan report, uh, which was recently launched by the bank um, in December. And one of the packages looks at women and young people and how they can be supported in a climate smart way. And in terms of poultry, one of the policy things is we've seen in Zimbabwe is our livestock has really been hit by lack of feed. Um, each time a drought hits, we have high poverty debts. We're also noticing drought. We're also noticing an increase in livestock disease that also um, affect um, our livestock productivity and therefore affect family and households. What we then proposed within the package was to support women with small ruminants um, in financing with small ruminants as well as poultry. Now there's the argument, well, if you support them in um, goats or sheep, they're really destructive to the environment. But I always say, well, no, let's think about alternative feeding methods that then allow for the reduction within, you know, your 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 graze your grazing lands or your range lands. And so discussions that, that have been put forward and that we are now dialoguing with is to say, well, how about we look at alternative grasses? So we're looking at the Bacaria grass, which is really a good grass, low carbon emissions. So it allows for that mitigation element we're talking about in terms of being climate smart, but it provides enough nutrients and feed for a really um, successful kind of um, ruminant production, right? So that's one aspect. But another aspect that is interesting me, which it actually brings in the youth, is this innovation around insects for feed as alternative feeding for um, for animals, so to add that protein. Um, a colleague of mine has termed it micro livestock, and that is an area that doesn't require much land area, which is where the youth in Africa are saying, well, we don't have land. How can we get into agriculture, right? But here, if you can start farming on using small boxes, using micro livestock. And when I'm talking about micro livestock, I'm talking about the production of black soldier flies. I'm talking about the production of mealworms, earthworms that can be added into livestock feed. And what that can also do is reduce the price of livestock feed, which we always find as a problem um, within, within smallholder farming. And my work in academia, which is now also kind of coming through into my policy work, I've always argued, and there's now quite a lot of literature that says young people and women really want to get into agricultural commercialization. So finding the ways in which or the entry points to bring them in becomes quite critical. And for me, the micro livestock is one focusing on the small ruminants for women, um, but focusing on it in a climate smart ways, I think is the way. So I'm really excited and I'm excited as well that the young people want to get into agriculture. So it's really, we are seeing this um, idea that young people just wanna go into urban areas and find jobs in Zimbabwe, in Ghana, in Tanzania, where I did this um, multi-country studies, young people are coming in, but let them come in within a green way, a climate smart ways. And some of these are the ideas that we are putting through. So as I said, I get excited about my work because I think it has a way of really impacting 
um, society and as we move from the brown economy into a more green economy. Thank you, Stephanie, and over to you. Thank you, Esther. That is so fascinating. I mean, it is great to hear how you're taking the problem of climate and also women in the workforce and finding solutions through climate smart agriculture, which which uh, which are also cutting edge. I mean, I would imagine I don't know this concept. I was taking notes about the micro livestock feed, but I would imagine that's something that could be applied potentially beyond uh, Zimbabwe uh, where you're working on this. So really fascinating to hear this. And thank you for opening my eyes up, both of you, in this area. I want to, in the few minutes we have left, I want to turn to something that I think is on a lot of people's minds. It's certainly been on mine. In this area of COVID, in this time of COVID, when we think about the climate and the environment, uh, there are, it's it's quite a mixed bag of results, right? I mean, we're, we're all seeing the clear skies, uh, fewer people are traveling, so carbon emissions are, are way down uh, recently just because of that travel piece. On the other hand, you see things like plastic pollution because of COVID that are way up. So it's a, it's a mixed bag, and I'm, I'm wondering what you're seeing, um, again, in your work, um, and let me start this time with, with Esther, on uh, how is COVID impacting what you're doing? How have things changed because of COVID for you and your line of work? Thank you. Um, thank you, Stephanie. I wanna take a personal um, view of what, how it's affected me. Um, and I'm taking it from a pollution standpoint. So when we entered into lockdown in March last year, and industry completely shut down, one of the clear things that I recall was sitting outside on my veranda, I think Americans might say patio, and, um, and I started noticing the birds. There were more birds in my garden. Actually, it wasn't me who noticed it, but it was my daughter and my son. And they said, mommy, look at that yellow bird. Oh, there's a red bird. And then we started really saying, hey, there must be something here. And it started ringing to me just how much living in the city, the pollution that you don't really think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but then I thought, um, well, you know, this is anecdotal. I'm seeing this. So let me go to the figures and what the World Bank um, has been doing through the poverty team um, within the sub-Saharan is they've been doing what they call high-frequency data monitoring on mobility pollution and food prices to monitor the impact of COVID-19. And what air pollution does is they've used it as a proxy um, of economic activity and mobility. And what we really saw in the data, I mean, when you see the graphs, you start seeing that, for example, if we look at the nitrogen dioxide um, density trend, it really decreased, right? And this team has been doing this frequency monitoring throughout this COVID period. Um, when the economy started opening up and we started going down in tears, and we look at the data now that was released, we're now starting to see an increase in the nitrogen dioxide um, density within, within the country. So there definitely is a, a, a thing there that we've got to be more cognizant about what we are doing as people, our actions. And I really think this COVID-19 has also really given us a period, almost a baseline of noting. I mean, I could see it within my garden and the statistics, the figures are showing us. And so this is part of the work that not really from the agriculture global practice, but we do cross support and our poverty global support came up with this data. Thank you very much. Of the team. Thanks so much, Esther. Uh, that's that's terrific to hear about both the personal and the birds, and I've experienced that too. Uh, and then, uh, and and more specifically, uh, what you're hearing from the research, uh, Faith. Let me ask you this: the same question. What are you seeing from COVID now? And uh, I'll mute. Yeah, I think. Um, quite similar to the experience that Esther has had because of a lockdown and working from the home has become the workplace. It also became the school and the daycare center. So for us, 
we made a very conscious effort for an escape, for an escape. So consciously once a, a week, especially on a Saturday, we go out, we take a walk, we walk the neighborhood and with the children. And uh, not only does it give us time to connect, you know, across the generations, but you know, the excitement that the children have when they spot that flower in bloom, when they spot that squirrel. So, and I think that's something that also helps or contributes towards dealing with mental issues, which I'm sure would also be coming up due to, uh, to the confinement uh, in the home. So yes, we're seeing the, the livestock, or so we're seeing the squirrels that otherwise we wouldn't see. And I also remember sometime last year, uh, I was reading um, the Agas, the local newspaper, and uh, the African penguin was seen walking the streets of Cape Town, something that last happened, I'm not sure how many years back. So it definitely points to something that's clean, either the clean environment or the clean air that's contributing to it. And then now also on a, another personal level as well, I've been from home since uh, March 2020. And that means I'm not driving to work and we're not also flying uh, to other uh, provinces or to other municipalities. In the Western Cape, we've got over, uh, we've got about 30 municipalities that uh, we're working with. So, which means we've been able to connect uh, virtually. And that means uh, it's also contributed greatly to reducing my carbon emissions a footprint. And it's something that I'm quite uh, uh, proud of. And quite linked to that as well, I've also become very conscious about printing. Um, and uh, yeah, I print when it's, at most, it's of utmost importance, and which is very different from when you're going to the workplace. And yeah, while I'm quite aware of not printing, but then sometimes say, ah, no, it's fine. So this has made me very conscious and I'm quite uh, glad to be saving the forest as well uh, in the process. Uh, and also ending off on a quite a positive note, I've also managed to be connecting globally. You see, we are also connecting. <laughs> as well i've managed to expand my network and also participate in the webinars um, and learning from best practice from what's happening say in california and how they're dealing with um, the fires because also the western cape is also prone to fires learning from those experiences and um, quite increasingly as well the terms that are coming up uh, is uh, the greening uh, greening the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. So with that, I think it's actually addressing two existential um, threats or issues in with one sort of budget, one budget stream. So addressing the immediate health impacts, that's uh, addressing uh, 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 the coronavirus pandemic. And secondly, also uh, building resilience to the anticipated um, impacts of climate change that are bound to take place. Because as a scientist has said, if we don't change our actions within this decade by 2030, then it might be too late for us to actually recover from climate change. Back to you, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Faith. Uh, I, I've gotten so much out of uh, listening to the two of you. And um, I want to just close by saying thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing your experience. Thank you for sharing your personal stories as well, which I think helps bring things to life. I also want to thank you for everything you do um, to uh, model. Uh, I think you, you are both great role models uh, for women and men, and uh, I thank you for that. Uh, and I think that uh, I frankly feel more confident and more optimistic knowing the two of you are on the job uh, taking care of these really important issues. So I'm gonna stop there and I will turn it over to Vesna to close out this Meg talk. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you very much, Esther. Thank you very much, Faith. I'll echo Stephanie's remarks. We're very optimistic when we see grantees like you and the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you for a riveting discussion. Uh, but the discussion doesn't need to end here. I will invite everybody looking at us or listening um, to visit our website and also to connect with us uh, with Meg on social media. And uh, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you.
Hello? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ms. Ah, okay. So, yes, so it's me again. And I will say again, that was a really riveting discussion. Um, let's get straight to the questions. There's some questions in the chat. I'll start with the first question. That's to Esther. And then I'll hand it over to Stephanie and Esther and Faith. And before we start, let me just say thank you so much to Esther and Faith for being with us because it's past midnight where you are. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, so the first question was to Esther specifically. Have you looked at some of the ancient grains and grasses, some of which use less water in terms of using them as animal feed? Um, thank you very much, Vesna, and thank you for the question. Um, as I spoke, we have started looking at insects for feed, and we've also started looking at ways in which we can use ruminants that are considered destructive to the environment. So there is quite a bit of research that is going through. And the one area that I'd been talking about was with the Bacaria grass, and I haven't yet looked in terms of other grains, but I think this is what this dialogue is all about in terms of learning and coming up with more information that we can actually use as we a go forward advising government and also go forward in terms of advising farmers. Um, just today, we had an amazing um, webinar with small holder farmers and we were exposing them to um, the World Bank's Agriculture Observatory and questions started coming up in terms of how can we really make our farming more productive, how can we make it less um, environmentally, um, that causes environmental degradation. So those are areas that we are beginning to look at and I think one of the great things about working for the bank is the broad uh, breadth of, of, of people with knowledge um, from the natural resources side and people who've worked in here. But um, as an answer to that, I've looked at a few grasses, but I haven't looked at the broader ancient grains. And I think that's quite pertinent in terms of the work and the policy dialogue. Um, over to you. Stephanie, do you want me to jump in? Uh, sure, go ahead. So we have two other questions that came through the chat and uh, they're very much interrelated. The, the, the ideas of agriculture and climate change and food security are so interrelated. And these uh, two questions touch on those three subjects. They're both agriculture related. Um, the, the questions are what would the government, and I, hear, I think here we can maybe hear from each of you, um, Faith and Esther, uh, what would the government do to support the country's need to make agriculture more climate friendly? So you could speak from the, the governments that you know best on that, on that question. And that was a question Grace asked and Carmen asked a similar question. What solutions must be designed for climate change effects on food scarcity? I think I got that right. Um, so uh, I don't know who wants to start, uh, but maybe could you both take a stab at that? Because I think that's in both of your realms. Uh, Esther, do you want to start since the camera's on you? Okay, great. And I, <laughs> I also want to say thank you so much for being, we weren't expecting you to be live here with us uh, so late at night uh, for you. So thank you so much. And um, we'll take any of your answers. They're all coherent, but uh, I'm very impressed that you can do that at midnight. Go ahead. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I think in terms of answering that, one of the things that is important is for governments to acknowledge the reality that climate change is here and that they are the effects of climate change, we're experiencing them. So really taking into account that it's a reality. When we look, and I'm really focusing on Zimbabwe because this is where I'm doing quite a lot of my work, but when we look at Zimbabwe, I recall as a kid um, and going to the rural areas and my grandmother saying to me, oh, you know, we have a really bad harvest um, this year. But it almost seemed like, you know, every maybe 10 years, et cetera. And when you look at the literature, 
and you look at the data, you were experiencing droughts every 10 years. Then we went to every five years. But what we're now experiencing are droughts almost every three to two, two to three years. And that is a reality that um, I think governments have now started looking at and even with our own government where it's like, look, for the past two years, Zimbabwe has not had any strategic grain reserves um, in, in, in terms of its storage. And the country has had to import grain since 20, um, so 2019 and 2020. And that shows you that was a reality that climate change is real, climate shocks are real. And what we have seen with the government coming in, in terms of looking at food security, they've actually taken on climate smart initiatives. And one of the areas that they have been promoting this year is a concept called Fumvudza. And that's a Shona word for really conservation agriculture. Uh, 1.8 million households have been encouraged by government to follow the conservation agriculture practices. So zero tillage, mulching, um, ways of retaining soil moisture within their farming systems. There's been a lot of training that is starting to take place with extension officers so that they can go and train the farmers. And I think that's a game changer when your government starts realizing that, hey, we have a reality here and it needs to be addressed. And when they start putting policies, and this is where I came in saying that as the bank, we've worked very closely with government, especially with um, coming up with the Climate Smart Agriculture Investment Plan. And part of it is really to really help in terms of sustaining food security, improving productivity in a very climate smart way. So I think in terms of answering that question, it's when it, people realize that there is a situation here, that climate change is real and we need to act. And we need to act in a smart way and not go back to yesteryears. Um, the reality is droughts are happening. Zimbabwe hit two back-to-back -back droughts, 2018-19, um, 2019-20 farming season. And we can see that now. And I think government has taken the right direction um, in moving forward and in also encouraging, especially smallholder farmers, so that 1.8 million are smallholder farmers that have been encouraged to follow the Pumbudza. Um, we will see how successful it is within the um, next few weeks as government is doing a crop and livestock assessment to see how much area has been covered and estimations on there. But I am a very key proponent in following climate smart initiatives, especially for production, um, in order to enhance food security. Um, I will hand over back to you, um, Stephanie and Vesna. Stephanie, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, I was saying that's very encouraging to hear, not the droughts, but the fact that the government is uh, facing the reality um, and doing something about it. Uh, that it, That is really good to hear. Um, Faith, do you want to jump in based on your experience in South Africa on the same question? Yes, that's right. I think um, I would like to also echo the sentiments that um, Esther mentioned, that I think we're starting to come to terms with it, that a droughts are a reality and um, they are going to be happening more frequently. Uh, and, and I think in this case, it's an issue of everything rising or falling on leadership. So I think the government uh, has the responsibility to provide that direction uh, to say, then how do we turn to more climate smart uh, practices? I can just take you uh, to a few years back in 2015 up until 2019 when the western cape made headlines because of the multi-year drought that we experienced to an extent that we had the threat of a day zero where we're saying that water was going to be tur turned off uh, from the tips uh, fortunately we managed to 
circumvent that and then we had uh, good rains. But yeah, within that period, we saw the government coming up or taking the leadership and uh, uh, coming up with, again, what you call smart agri, uh, smart agricultural practices. That's a plan that uh, the Department of Agriculture within the Western Cape government is uh, is implementing or taking a lead in. And uh, in Smart Agri, they, it's actually an approach where um, on the uh, action side, it's matching the different cultivars to the soil types and also using the uh, projections that have been uh, made for the Western Cape to say, okay, if so, if the rainfall is going to be projected to, to decrease by such a, a percentage, so which cultivars should we actually be introducing so that uh, looking at how we change uh, the, the crops or the plants that um, the farmers uh, are, are producing on their lands. And this also applies to both the commercial farmers and the, the smallholder farmers as well within the Western Cape. And uh, yeah, so that it could actually be a change from uh, growing grapes, that's what uh, the Western Cape is quite well known for, to maybe moving more to cereal growing so that we match uh, the existing climate with the crops that are on the ground. And in that way, we ensure that uh, the, 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 the food basket or food security of a region is promoted and maintained. And um, yeah, the other thing I think that uh, governments can also do to ensure that uh, agriculture remains uh, climate friendly is to have strong collaborations with research and uh, science so that policy science uh, sort of interface keeping it alive so that uh, for all the policies that are made of all decisions that are made they are supported by uh, scientific evidence uh, of how climate is going to be affecting the specific regions and then planning along those lines. I think in that way, um, the governments will be quite successful in making their uh, agriculture more climate friendly. And that will also have uh, knock on effects on promoting the food security within a region. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, and yeah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faith and Esther. Um, so interesting, again, to have a chance to talk to you about this. Um, I know we're running out of time in terms of uh, closing. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Vesna in a second. One of the things that we said we were really hoping to also hear, since this is the first of a series of MEG talks, is any feedback uh, that any of uh, the 50 or so of you on the line have about how you would like to see the MEG talks going forward. We would love to hear from you either now or um, in the in the weeks to come. Uh, but let me stop there because I think we're almost out of time and uh, I will turn it back over to Vesna. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Um, before we close, yes, yeah, so we would be very happy for any feedback or any comments. If anyone has a short closing comment to make now, we'd be very happy. Otherwise, you can also send them to us uh, at a later date. Um, thank you very much again, Faith. Thank you very much again, Esther, for making yourselves available and for being here to answer our questions. Uh, thank you also for the work that you're doing and uh, for how you are very adamantly continuing the struggle and uh, in the face of the in the face of uh, the challenges that we have at the moment in the in terms of the environment thank you very much and uh, we're very proud to have been able to contribute in a small way to the work that you're doing um before we close um we just have a few minutes left i'd like to close by reminding you of the special and unique fundraiser that uh, madeleine mentioned in her opening remarks which is our virtual anniversary luncheon. And so this will be held uh, later this year in November, and uh, we will have 462 place settings at one lunch. So 462 being the 462 extraordinary women who have received grants from Meg. And we would love for all our grantees to have a seat at the table. So we would really like to ask you, um, to generously sponsor a grantee place setting 
for an amount of $40 each per setting. And uh, you can go to our website to check that out to, to see how you can make a donation for this fundraising, which we will be doing in November. And we will share updates with you as our virtual table fills up and you can see the grantees gathering around the table. Thank you all very much. And um, please keep the questions coming. Uh, this is being recorded, as you know, so the questions are not going to disappear and they will be answered. Thank you so much. Stephanie, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I just wanna say that one of the most heartening things that I uh, felt as we were uh, conducting this interview uh, with Esther and Faith is what I heard them say afterwards when we stopped recording, which is that they so appreciate the fact that they are now connected. And it's clear, I think, to them and to us how much they have in common. Uh, and, uh, and so I think part of our role is connecting the grantees to each other so that they have a chance uh, to build their network and be part of a, a group of really exceptional women. So that's one of my favorite parts uh, coming out of this uh, Meg Talk, Talk initiative. Thank you all for being here. And remember on the website, there's a comment section where you can actually send us your messages. And we love having you here. And I think in April, we will have a next TED talk, but the calendar is on the website. So we'll touch base soon. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.